Hi, everyone. Uh, Hi, all. Uh, see Same Harry, you. Harsha, yeah, Shri. Harsha. Peter, hello. All right, well, it is four minutes past the hour, so I'm going to start going over our housekeeping notes here. Q&A. Please enter your Q&A throughout the session by using the chat. Um, if you have um, a question that's maybe more elaborate that you'd like to ask, you may do so by raising your hand. So the raise your hand button um, might appear different for you all, but under for us, it's under the reactions button. Uh, but I think you may have it on your main toolbar. Um, and then also, speaking of the reactions button, we love to see the reaction. See how I just did claps, right? I'm sure Melissa and Jay will love to see your claps and smiley faces and and all the and thumbs up and all those things. Thank you for those. I see them already. <laughs> so it helps us be a little bit more interactive, right? Um, and then let's see raffle. So yes, Melissa, you can go to that next slide. Um, we are having a raffle today for all of you who are attending. We appreciate you being here and we have a cool raffle prize, which is a set of raspberry pies and all of the fixins to build your own Kubernetes cluster. Um, so at the end of the event, I will announce the raffle winner. So make sure and stick around and you are all entered for, for being here. Um, so with that, I will go ahead and pass it over to Chris from Quad Corps uh, to introduce himself very quickly. Hi, Chris. Hey guys, thanks everybody for, and thank you, Taryn, and thanks everybody for joining and, and showing your support for this meetup. Um, just a very quick intro to, to us and Quad Core. If you don't know who we are, we, we, we operate solely within the API at microservices and integration space, um, and we are an official Kong partner. So, um, Cold Core has existed for a couple of years and um, I've recently joined as well as Jay um, because collectively we saw a bit of a negative trend in, in outcomes and behaviours from consultancies whereby fees were higher than value that's actually delivered to customers. So, I mean, essentially we want to bring back a level of humanity into consultancies and I think we've got a good chance at changing the equation to bring a bit of equitable fairness and value to the industry and, and i'm not talking just for our customers but for for ourselves as well and that's very much built on kind of investing in people and collaborating with the community which has been something we've done in, in other meetup communities and, and and why we're involved today so um we're of the opinion that the best answers rise to the top um and and that's why we sort of collaborate with the community and that's how we manage to optimize ourselves to deliver value to our customers so that's us that's what we do um over to uh, the real reason you're here jay and melissa thank you chris jay should we just introduce ourselves quickly before we kick things off yeah go for it why don't you start off sure hi everybody i am so excited for this meetup wish we were in person but being virtual means i'm sat here in my slippers, not going to lie. Um, I am uh, Melissa van der Hecht. I am field CTO of EMEA at Kong. I've been here for a couple of years and I've been in the API and integration space for over seven years. So this is a subject that I'm very passionate about. Jay, you? Thanks, Melissa. So um, Jay, most people know me as um, um, director at CodCore, looking after multiple engagements at the moment. I'm doing a Kong residency to you know, get real hands-on with Kong and understand the technology and, and the product um, deeply. Uh, being in the integration and API space for over a decade. Um, so, you know, done various different roles, everything from kind of project management to development to architecture. Um, so yeah, uh, Melissa, back to you to kind of kick us off. Thanks, Jay. Um, the, the topic of today's meetup is how we can become more efficient, more productive, enjoy ourselves more when we are building APIs, when we are deploying APIs, managing APIs, and following the API lifecycle. For those of us that have been in this space for quite a while, I'm sure we've seen the introduction of different types of roles, culture change, people talking about evangelism, design first approaches. There's been an increasing focus on 
how we need to organize ourselves as API stakeholders in order to maximize the productivity that we have in the API lifecycle. So I'm going to start off by telling a little bit of a story as to how we got to where we are now. And then Jay and I will talk and demo and show you some of the new tips and tricks that you can do to increase productivity that we didn't used to have. There we go. Love Google Slides. So the first approach that, that I saw and that most of us saw in the industry when companies first adopted APIs was to invest in a, a global API management platform. Companies said, oh, you know, we want to achieve operational efficiency and business agility by enabling people to reuse APIs. So we'll put this platform in place that everybody has access to and say, right, stick your APIs in there, secure them using the policies in there that are out of the box and stick them in a portal so that they're discoverable. And at first, that sounds great, right? You've got discoverability, you've got security. But what we're doing here is a rather siloed approach. We never invested in the very early days. We didn't really understand, to be honest, what API best practices were, what it meant to treat an API as a product, how to enable different stakeholders in the organization to do APIs in the right way. So what we ended up doing was to uh, build, deploy, and publish APIs very rapidly, but build a big, mess of inconsistency and a lack of standards just as rapidly because each of the different engineering teams that was using or producing or consuming APIs thought about them differently. Some teams would have their own standards, some teams would understand API best practices, others wouldn't. So you would end up with a complete mix of differing qualities of your APIs in a platform. And when you think about the goals of API adoption of reuse of enabling people to adopt a discovery led mindset to consume APIs rather than build them from scratch. If our APIs are too inconsistent, if they are insecure and we forgot to secure a couple when we've deployed them, if we haven't documented them or made them discoverable in a portal, we are not helping our consumers to reuse our APIs. So companies started to evolve their thinking and conversation changed to uh, in the majority of organizations, but not all, the creation of an API platform team or a person or a role, somebody who acted as a gatekeeper, a governor of the platform who said, right, Jay, I know that you're building APIs. I'm not going to give you access to publish them in production. Instead, you've got to go through me. And I'm going to check that whether or not the APIs you're building actually meet our organization's best practice. So then Jay submits his APIs to me. I manually go through and I say, oh, this spec doesn't comply. Hey, this linting, it's failed to linting. Or this, uh, this API already exists. Why are you building it again? So I would do all these manual reviews. I'd push back on Jay and say, Jay, you're rubbish. Do it again. Not good enough. Um, so what we end up with in this approach uh, is a lot of friction, a lot of bottlenecks, and a lot of delays in that interaction between the engineering teams, the development teams, and these gatekeepers of the platform. To try and overcome that, this is when conversation turned to evangelism. This is when, I mean, it was a daily conversation for me a few years ago, culture change, uh, design first mindset. We did hackathons, lunch and learns, all these kinds of activities I'm sure that many of you have done. And don't get me wrong, these are all still very valid and very necessary activities. But these activities are basically very high touch ways of me investing my time, of Jay investing his time, and me saying, here is some written documentation. Jay, go read it and manually change the way that you're working so that you comply with what I'm telling you to do. But because we put it under the badge of evangelism, we kind of think, oh, hey, that's, you know, it's good enough. 
but we are finding as API adoption is increasing, as our environments are becoming increasingly decentralized, as we have more and more and more teams adopting and building APIs in some way, this approach does, just doesn't scale anymore. So we see that, yes, this time around with our centralized approach, because I'm the manual gatekeeper and I check everything for standards, everything that ends up being deployed follows standards, but we've ground to a halt. We've put in roadblocks, we put in manual checkpoints and we've created friction and that reduces productivity. And frankly, that makes all of us pretty miserable. Um, Taryn, I would love it please if we could launch the first poll when it comes to delivering and deploying APIs, I am wondering, those of you here, are you finding yourselves having to sacrifice quality because you're having to move so fast? Are you moving very slowly because you do have rigorous checkpoints? Maybe it's a more of a regulated organization you're in. Or are you figuring out a way to actually deliver with both speed and quality across all of your APIs. I'm seeing quite a few results come in now. This is very interesting. Okay, we're on about 64% uh, voted. I'm sure a couple more have got an opinion on this. Oh, yes. Yeah, lots of results coming in. This is very, very interesting. All right, great. Can we show the results, please? Uh, I'm going to take a on? moment to display them here. Yep. This happened with my last poll. Okay, share results. There we are. Got it. Wonderful. So this is really interesting. We're seeing just over half of you are having to sacrifice quality because you're deploying quickly. Not very many of you are delivering slowly. And I'm so happy that a good number of you, not quite half, but a good number of you are delivering with both speed and quality. I have run this poll um, many times over several months. I, I think across like several hundred respondents now, I've seen a very consistent result. And that is typically only 20% of attendees are able to deliver with both speed and quality. I am seeing on the whole about 80% of the people that we speak with at Kong are struggling and having to trade off between speed and quality somehow. What Jay and I are going to show you is how you can join everybody in this third bucket here and how you can deliver with both speed and quality across the API lifecycle. Closing the poll. So what we are going to show you is API ops. This is not a complete brand new approach. This is an evolution of what we saw before. This is automating previous manual processes in the API lifecycle. This is providing stakeholders with self-serve tooling so that it just becomes easier to get through these hurdles of making sure we follow best practice. And therefore we can actually focus on the fun part, the difficult part, the part that requires the problem solving, building the APIs, working out what is it that consumers actually need without having to spend ages dealing with the fact of best practice. So let's walk through bit by bit what the API lifecycle looks like with API ops. I'm not going to explain what the API lifecycle is. I'm sure that most people are familiar with it and there's loads of easy stuff on the internet if you'd like to read more about it. But with API ops, the steps in the lifecycle are the same. What is different are the processes that we follow at each step and in between each step. So at design time, this is where best practice, we follow a design first approach and we want to use Swagger or Open API to describe what our API needs to do. We should also write tests for that API so that we can ensure that whatever is built checks against those endpoints. I'm gonna go away from Google Slides now and we're gonna get stuck into the technology. Let me show you Insomnia. Insomnia is an open source API design environment. You can go to insomnia.rest to download it. 
Insomnia is part of Kong and part of Kong Connect. So we have integration with Insomnia across all of the different Kong components. Within Insomnia, you can see I've opened up uh, the specification for one API. This is the Open API Pet Store 1.0.2. This is the default Swagger or OAS example API. On the left hand side in Insomnia, we've got a few different options that uh, help me to explore this API that I'm building. For example, it'll give me a summary of the uh, uh, information of the API that I've embedded within the Swagger. It'll show me the different servers that I've set up. This is a very useful one. This is a fairly long spec. So this is showing me a breakdown of all the different methods on each of the different paths that I'm creating. On the right hand side, this is a dynamic explorer for this spec. As soon as I make changes within the Swagger, this explorer will change. So this gives me an interactive way to understand what this API will do. Generally, that's a lot easier than actually reading through the Swagger and therefore translating that into API functionality in your mind. And you can also expand out different uh, requests in here, have a look at the example schemas and start to try some of them out. But what I want to show you very quickly before I hand over to Jay is some of the capabilities within this design environment. We have in the middle is my specification. We have linting in Insomnia. This is the process of ensuring that my specification adheres to Swagger best practices. At the moment, you can see everything is being rendered. There's nice colors. I'm not seeing any errors. So this linting, it's always happening and the linting is currently passing. But I can type in a whole load of rubbish and you will see suddenly things have just broken. This is the linting. This is telling me that what I am doing is correct or incorrect. And at design time, I can make sure immediately that I don't actually move on to the next phase of the life cycle until I fixed all of these errors. The second thing that I want to show you in here, let's get rid of those errors, there we go. I'm gonna scroll right down to the bottom of this very long specification and show you, we have this uh, snippet here that I've highlighted at the bottom. This says XCOM plugin rate limiting. This is me saying at design time, I know that when we deploy this API, it needs to have a rate limiting plugin applied to it. And this is the configuration for that plugin. So because I'm gonna be deploying this within Kong, I can embed the YAML in the, the Swagger I can embed the definition of this plugin here. So this means even at design time, I can start applying governance that I know about. Perhaps you know that um, you're going to need to apply a cause plugin. Perhaps you want to apply a mocking plugin. Perhaps there's various types of security plugins that you know you're going to have to be applied. So you specify them here. What we can do when we've created our spec, Insomnia has a debug mode. This means we can make requests to the API. We support not just REST, but GraphQL and gRPC here. And we can make tests for our API. We can create whole suites for our API. We can construct our tests through this nice GUI, um, select whatever request we wanna make a test against, and then change the, uh, the code that we've got in here. And once we've written our tests, once we're satisfied that our API meets best practice, I have, I'm gonna move my zoom, there we go. I can um, commit this into my Git repo, put a commit message, and I can push this into Git. And I can do all of this without having left the insomnia environment. So let me go back and talk through what happens next. And then I'm gonna hand over to Jay. So before we get onto the build phase, we don't necessarily know that this API meets all of the best practices that the organization has specified. 
maybe Jay has actually just been creating this API in Insomnia. I sit within a centralized platform team and I haven't seen that he's passed all of these checks within the IDE because it's all, all on his computer. I want a programmatic way to ensure that every single API that he submits to me, that Chris submits to me, that Taryn submits to me, that every team submits to me, I want a programmatic way to ensure that everything is checked for best practice. So I have this automated governance checkpoint in my pipeline. Jay, over to you. Thanks, Melissa. I've got to say, I've been in many, many of those review sessions as both you know, as a, as a developer, if you like, as well as an architect reviewing the spec. And, you know, I find them time consuming when I was a developer, what I wanted to do was, um, you know, spend time, more time kind of building the API, um, et cetera. So, you know, any time where you can automate it and get essentially instant feedback, I, I, you know, it's a plus one from me, if you like. Um, right, so hopefully people can see my screen. Um, I just want to give a little bit of context before um, I kind of do the demo. So we, we are essentially in a, a Kubernetes environment. You know, we're using a, a D2 IQ cluster to run the demo, um, you know, and we've got Kong deployed essentially as an ingress resource in Kubernetes. So it's acting as an ingress point as well as a gateway kind of simplifying, um, you know, the Kubernetes setup. Uh, what we've got is Tecton doing our CI part, and we've got something called Flux CD doing our continuous deployment. Um, so that's just, just to give a, a little bit of a brief. I, I have got a diagram right at the end where I can kind of give you an overview. Um, so what have we got here? Um, so I've just clicked into a particular pipeline we run, and you'll recognize the, the, the different stages from the API lifecycle. And one of the first things that you'll notice that we're doing is, um, oh, I might have to re-log in. One of the first things you'll notice is that we are, we're doing the linting that we, we've talked about. Um, the linting is, is kind of out of the box and there are, um, you know, there, there's actually about 158 different checks that, that are happening as part of this. I just wanna walk through a few examples here. So, you know, you can see there's 22 warnings that have been picked up. A lot of these are around operations not having a 200 response. So, uh, you know, that's a fairly simple check, uh, you know, where it, it, you're checking, is there a 200 response? And if there's a 200 response, um, you know, you know that's a successful operation. If there isn't a 200 response, then you have to think about, well, what is this operation doing? Um, so this is, this is really a good mechanism for doing that. Uh, I'm not, I'm not going to spend too long on walking through, um, you know, each of the, uh, the rules, but you can, you can see a good number of rules here, and you can see what a, a good example and a bad example of some of these are. And as you can tell, there's, there's quite a number of rules that are being run in an automated fashion. Um, I find this really useful because I don't have to wait around for somebody to review this um, and kind of you know, especially when you're kind of mid sprint and you're trying to rush through right at the end, all the reviews, etc. It can be quite a intense experience. So having this means that you get instant feedback and you can kind of spend more time doing doing the API development and getting that right. Um, so that's an interesting, you know, interesting aspect to be able to do this automatically. Um, before I kind of go into the build phase, um, you know, I want to hand it back to uh, Melissa and I'm just going to bring up the, the slides. So hopefully you can see the slides here. Uh, Melissa, do you want to walk us through the, uh, the build phase? Oh, I, think I did it. I was on <laughs> <laughs> 
So these automated governance checkpoints that Jay just showed us, all of the linting capabilities that we get in Insomnia, we get in a CLI around Insomnia that's called Inso. You can also download that from insomnia.rest. It's open source. And this means through uh, Inso, through the spectral linting that Jay also showed us, you can um, programmatically invoke lots of checking of that spec. If anything fails, it can be immediately rejected. If we're doing this through Git, for example, you can say, oh, I've got a new uh, spec to submit. I'm creating a, a pull request to PR. And as part of that creation of the pull request, you can have these tests automatically executed. And if any of those tests fail, you can push straight back to the person creating the swagger and say, no, this bit needs to change. It's not complying with best practice. From a platform team point of view, there's no manual involvement. We are saving a huge amount of time not having to do these manual checks. And from Jay's point of view, designing the spec, he gets instant feedback and he gets this automated feedback. So it's a lot easier to actually ensure that you're doing the right thing at design time before you move on to build. And then ultimately, if you click again, Jay, please, ultimately you'll pass the automated governance. If we're in Git, the PR can be approved and therefore the code merged. And then we can move on to the build phase. Now, this is where we're following API best practice. We build the implementation according to what has been specified in that now validated API spec. We want to build this in whatever tool, whatever language, whatever platform is best for the use case. Maybe that's custom code. Maybe that's Java or .NET. Maybe it's Node.js. Maybe it's an integration platform or an iPaaS. Doesn't matter. Within Kong, we support all of them. But you need to be able to uh, build your API based on what's in that spec. And then the tests that we created at design time, they're actually our unit tests. We use them during the build phase to make sure that the API that we're implementing or make sure that the implementation actually does do the same functionality as what the spec described. Jay, back to you to bring that to life. Thank you, Melissa. Um, absolutely. So if you think back to what I said earlier, what we've done is we've now linted the design so we're now happy with you know um in so doing the lint and we essentially um check the specification that we're happy that it passes all the um you know the rules that we have set etc and now we are ready to move on to the build phase uh, one of the things that you'll notice that what we're using is again insomnia um, to do the unit test. And I'll, I'll show that very quickly before I kind of walk through what's happening here. Um, you can see that we've got three tests that are being run uh, and, they, and they all pass here. Um, as a developer, you know, if there's a regression test, I might not run through all the regression pack. I might just test the few things that I've changed, uh, commit my code, and then I know this pipeline is going to run a regression pack, which may contain, um, you know, a, a, a more a significant number of um, tests. And again, um, we are essentially using Inso, and Inso is um, the CLI version of Insomnia. And just to show an example, um, within Insomnia here, um, you know, these are some of the tests that Melissa showed us earlier. Um, and they are built at the same time as we're designing the spec. So again, you can kind of take some of the test-driven uh, development philosophies here. So at design time, you're building the tests and you're then building the API to pass these tests. So this is, this is really a, a, a good mechanism um, to do that. Again, if you wanted to run um, different tests kind of ad hoc, you could also do this. I know a lot of people use things like Postman, um, et cetera, or even things like JMeter uh, to do, do some of these tests. So again, this is kind of all built in into a single environment. Um, it's kind of version control built in. 
Um, so it makes that really simple to do, um, if you like. So you can see I'm getting responses back 200. You can see some of the um, headers that are coming back. You can see that rate limiting has been applied. Um, you know, I've got, if I go back to the design specification here at the end, um, I've actually applied two separate plugins. One is a um, rate limiting plugin with, you know, 1,000 uh, requests per minute and also cause plugin. So um, we can have requests coming from many different domains, not just the domain that's deployed on. Um, and what, what we're essentially doing in, in the pipeline is running these unit tests through a CLI in an automated fashion. Um, and these steps here, um, the thing to mention about these steps is that I've seen so many different variations of automated pipelines, right? The key thing is that uh, about these pipelines is that they should follow GitOps philosophies um, and they should follow kind of DevOps philosophies. Um, as long as you're kind of following those uh, two philosophies, um, there's a lot of variations in the pipeline and how that's going to happen. Um, so essentially what we're doing is we're kind of deploying into an environment where it's purely just for automated tests. Uh, we're deploying and we're, we're, we're then kind of testing it before we move in and deploy into a real environment, if you like. I am going to cover more of how we do the deployments, et cetera, uh, when we talk about the deploy phase. Uh, but I just wanted to kind of bring this up to say, look, that there is many different variations. And this is a, a, a kind of a, a very simplified uh, pipeline um, that I think you can draw inspiration from um, in, for API ops. Uh, Melissa, back to you on uh, deploy. Uh, it might be a good, uh, good point to pause for any questions if people got any questions. We've had a few questions coming in uh, in the chat, which I've been answering. I think, yeah, please feel free if you've got questions as we go along, keep it going in the chat. Um, we're on hand to answer all of them. The, what you were saying just now, um, the, Osh has just I learned asked how the recently. build was done. Osh just asked how was the build done? Build was done. I'm, I'm actually, so let me quickly go through that. Um, so that we're doing a number of different things here in terms of build. Uh, what we've done is we've, we're essentially building a stub, if you like. So we've, we've built a stub in, um, in Spring Boot. Um, so you can see the Maven command here where, when it loads up, where we're doing that build. If it loads. Yeah, so you, you can see um, we're, we're essentially doing a Maven build package. Uh, what we're then doing is creating a Docker image and then pushing that Docker image um, to Docker Hub. So the image in Docker Hub becomes our redeployable artifact that we can push through different environments. So hopefully that answers your question, Harry. Yeah, Jay, thank you. Cool. We switch back to the slides again, slides, Jay. Yeah. Um, um, the, like, I mean, I'm sure this is uh, something that everybody uh, is already very aware of, the importance of doing testing like this as early on in the pipeline as possible and as often as possible. And I heard a stat recently that really uh, brought to life for me how important it is. Mm -hmm. Um, this is an estimate. Um, it is estimated that to find and fix a bug at design time costs 1% of what it would cost if you found that in production. So the more that we can test throughout the API lifecycle like this in this completely automated way, the cheaper, the more efficient, and the better it is for 
us as engineers, for our organi organizations, um, and for the quality of our APIs. Yeah. So let's say that we've passed all of these tests, we've caught all of those errors that are going to um, trip us up in production, and it is time to move on to deployment. Uh, next one, please. This here is, um, I mean, I love all of this pipeline, but this is my favorite part of the pipeline. This is all about declarative configuration now. And Jay mentioned a couple of minutes ago, GitOps. What we're doing here is taking that principle of GitOps, that declarative driven way of deploying code, we are taking that and applying it to our API life cycles. And in this context, we are applying it to the different types of Kong runtimes because they all support it. Um, move forward one slide, please, Jane. Yeah. Just going to do a very quick comparison of what uh, imperative and declarative is, because the idea of CICD and automated deployments is not new. And the idea of CICD in the API lifecycle is not new. But when you dig into it a bit further, a lot of the CICD support that uh, technologies provide is for imperative automation. An imperative, as you can see on the left, is A, a lot more lines of code than declarative, um, and B, it is more complex because uh, you specify all of the steps that need to be followed in order to achieve the outcome that you want. Declarative is ignoring all of those steps and just saying what outcome you want and the technology that you're deploying to takes care of the steps in order to get there. So in, uh, in the context of deployments, for example, if we were to deploy to Kong imperatively, you would write a script that says, call this admin API, get this token, use the token to make a call to this API, apply the plugin configuration using this API call, and thus you would continue. This is great, you've written a script, you can therefore automate it. The admin API changes, you've got to update your script. If you're trying to troubleshoot, you've got a longer script to try and step through to figure out where the problem is. Compare that to declarative. We would just say, hey, com gateway, this is what you need to look like after this API has been deployed, including the um, configuration of all these plugins, like the rate limiting plugin. You don't have to specify calling the admin API, getting any of the authentication tokens. It just takes care of that for you. Um, so one more slide, please, Jay. So what we do is generate a declarative configuration file for Con from the API specification. We do not even need to write the script ourselves. And I'll hand back over to you, Jay, to show that. Thank you, Melissa. Um, it's interesting what you say about uh, finding a bug in production and how much it costs, because I've, I've been in many P1 and S1 situations where, you know, just the sheer number of people that get involved um, and the whole kind of, uh, you know, management and reporting and, you know, and, and, you know, not to forget the number of uh, nights and pizzas ordered to, to get it resolved, if you like. So I, I can certainly believe that 1% claim, uh, if you like, in terms of the cost. Um, so I do think that's, you know, that's kind of important. And anybody who's been in a P1 or S1 situation can, can kind of understand how much a, a simple bug or, a, you know, a change that's gone wrong can really hurt. Um, so that's 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 key. Um, so in terms of where we are in, in our phase, uh, before I kind of go into um, the deploy and what's happening there, what I want to do is just show you uh, in Insomnia um, the UI tool, and you can do this through the Inso CLI as well. Um, you can generate declarative config for. Um, you know, for, for, for the swag spec that you've, you've built. And what this allows you to do is configure the gateway with the different rules um, and, the, and the different um, services that you need, as well as the plugins you need uh, to 
essentially proxy and manage that API. Uh, so going straight from the swag spec, you can then have a configuration that you can apply. Um, earlier, I mentioned that we're kind of in Kubernetes world. Um, so again, Inso and Insomnia allow you to generate um, Kubernetes CRDs. So here you can see um, ingress uh, definitions being created. You could also um, see what plugins are being uh, generated and applied in Kubernetes. And um, this is really important because once you've applied the CRDs to Kubernetes, then it's Kubernetes API server that is making sure that your environment is matching the state that you described. And if there's been a drift, it will bring that back. So this is, this is really key in terms of moving to a declarative config. Uh, what, what people tend to do is either generate this on the fly from the Swagger specification and apply that, or if people want to make any kind of additional tweaks or additional um, Kubernetes annotations, um, then they generate it, commit this into Git, uh, and then use this as the, as the manifest to do the deployment. Um, so going from design, um, you know, you're able to kind of generate um, Kubernetes as well as kind of uh, declarative config for Kong um, if you're deploying Kong in a non Kubernetes environment, or if you're using in a Kubernetes environment, then Kong is kind of very cloud native and it works within the Kubernetes ecosystem, just using, you know, cube CRDs if, if people are familiar with um, Kubernetes terminologies there. Um, so what are we doing in the deploy phase? So we're doing a number of things. So first thing that, that we're doing uh, is actually we're deploying the image into a performance environment. And you can see um, you know, some of the uh, commands for Docker Compose to build, build that image. Uh, what we're then using is configuring the gateway, essentially. Um, so you can see that we're applying the, uh, the different plugins. We're also configuring the ingress. Um, details. And again, this is all kind of applied through um, kubectl commands, um, et cetera. The next thing that we're doing is we're using a tool called K6 uh, to essentially run a mini performance test. And what you get is right at the end is you get this nice little dashboard where you can see the average response time. You can see things like the 90 percentile, 95 percentile. Um, you know, we, we've done something very simple here, but essentially if you wanted, you could run a full salt test overnight. Uh, if that's something, you know, your environment needed, et cetera. So this is, this is interesting. Um, one of the th key things about K6 is that we generated all of these tests or the skeleton for the test from the Swagger file. So essentially, uh, we code gen the, the set of tests and we just kind of put in parameters to say, look, what are the TPS we want to run? What are the ro loads that we want to run? So that's kind of a, a, an interesting aspect here that um, we're doing here. The second thing that we're doing here is running a whole bunch of security tests. And you can see here all the tests that our particular implementation has uh, passed. Uh, we, we've even got a warning about a SQL injection, <laughs> um, if you like, and that's probably because the, um, the rate limiting clicked in. So obviously we need to make sure there's enough um, scope in the rate limiting to run all of these tests. But you can see um, the number of tests that are being run. Um, et cetera. And again, the key thing that we're doing here is essentially we are passing in the Swagger specification and 
into the test, we are passing in what environment we want to run the test against, and we are getting an automated um, security test back. And this is against the actual implementation. Um, I know a lot of folks do kind of dependency vulnerability checks, etc. Uh, but you know, I I, I really believe. Um, doing a check against the actual implementation, uh, because even though your dependencies might be safe and there are no kind of vulnerabilities, um, as a developer, I might have, you know, unknowingly introduced any kind of security vulnerabilities or actually the way the API is being secured or configuration in the gateway has been misconfigured. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. There are a number of things that might lead to a security flaw. Um, and this is a good way of picking this up. And again, uh, this is something as a platform team, you could automate and say, must be part of every pipeline uh, for every API. Um, so this is, for me, this is, this is a critical part before you really publish the API for kind of wider consumption uh, and use. So I'm going to pause here for any more questions um, before I kind of hand back to Melissa. Feel free right. and unmute yourself if you'd rather just speak as well rather than type. Yeah, I'll, I'll look up for any questions in the chat, but Melissa, back to you in terms of um, publish. Thanks. The, I, I'm not going to ask anybody to uh, put their hands up to this, but I have seen a scarily large number of organizations go live having forgotten to secure their APIs. Now, this is absolutely critical, what Jay just showed us. We do not want to make our APIs discoverable. We do not want to publish them until we've made sure that we've passed all of those security checks, that all of our API authentication has been applied, that performance is adequate, because an API endpoint that we expose, whether that's internally or externally, it is a product, right? We will uh, suffer reputational damage if our APIs don't work, if they're not reliable, if they're not secured, if they don't do what they say they're going to do. So all of these checks are making sure that by the point we get to publishing it, they are consumable. Jay, if you skip forward, please. Ah, you've yeah. done it already. Thanks. So when it comes to publishing, we have to make sure for an API to be consumable, we have to make sure that it is discoverable. It is easy to find, it's easy to access, and it's easy to use. Therefore, it must exist in the portal and documentation must exist for that API. The only way to ensure that you are documenting all your APIs in a portal, all of your APIs, is to automate that publishing step. So what Jay's going to show you now is how you can automate the publishing of this pet store API into the Kong dev portal. Thanks, Melissa. Um, so what we've got is a publish step, and we, we've actually got a, a few steps beyond that because what this pipeline is kind of demonstrating is a whole bunch of automated tests before you, you know, publish and make an API available in staging or UAT or maybe even, even production if, if you're feeling brave. Um, and you, you know you're, you're making these kind of changes all the time. Um, what you can see is essentially we're taking the spec and we're using the spec to essentially hit Kong's admin APIs and push the specification and make this available in an API portal. Uh, but we are only doing that once we are happy um, that all of these other checks you know, we're, we're comfortable with those um, and, and they have passed. Um, and what we can then do is essentially promote this API into a new environment and make that available. Um, so what, is, what does that look like? So um, I'm gonna show you, um, so this is the Kong 
portal. And this is, if you like, the, um, the specification that's been uh, exposed. And you'll find that it looks very, very similar to uh, what you saw at design times in terms of um, you know, being able to navigate the, the different requests and the different operations and the resources. Um, and you, you have features that you typically expect in terms of being able to um, you know, try it out and get a response back, uh, et cetera. Um, so again, this makes it really simple to make your APIs discoverable. You don't have to go in and um, manually publish this. Um, if you've got additional documentation, you can document that as markdown and it gets automatically pushed into a portal like this, um, which, which is um, really important. What I also wanna show you is Kong Manager. And here you can see um, the different config that we've, we've sort of applied uh, I guess what's what's interesting is the um, config around rate limiting, et cetera, that we've applied, and you can see what that is. So you can see here um, we've we've got the plugin uh, at a thousand per minute, which is what we've configured in the Swagger spec. So you can now see that being applied in the Cog Manager UI. Um, you could also see those being applied to the, um, uh, if you like, different ingress points uh, being applied. And what you can see here is that this is now being managed by a ingress controller. So we know that Kubernetes uh, is kind of managing all of this config. Uh, and essentially, we're using the Kong manager as a view to see what the current state in Kong is. Um, etc. Any any questions on what you're seeing so far? Okay. So what I'm going to do is just switch back to the slides. Um, Melissa, did you want to talk a little bit about operate? Yeah, just a quick note on here. Um, obviously, once we've followed the API lifecycle, tested, designed our API, built it, tested it, published it, et cetera, that's not quite the end of the story, really. We have all of the ongoing operations that we need to support. And the declarative configuration, the automation that we've showed you so far, so far also supports automated operations. For example, if there is, if you're a retailer and it's Black Friday, you are going to need to scale out your deployments, most probably. You don't want to have to spend ages writing a whole load of build scripts. You want to instantly be alerted, oh, our, um, our uh, throughput is going up. Let's automatically deploy new instances of Kong, deploy new instances of this API and scale out horizontally. The declarative configuration file, you can use that same configuration to spin up a new instance of this API or a new instance of Kong. And you know that you've got something that follows the spec, the single source of truth and whatever you deploy, you know is going to be the, a, a copy of the API you've already got running. Maybe you want to change some of the plugin configuration. Um, um, Sri, I think you asked this earlier on in the chat. You can either do that through the specification. If you are making changes in the spec, you're adding a new resource, or if you're changing plugin configuration within there. Easy to do. You change it in the spec. You generate the declarative config. You go through the deployment with all the testing, of course, in between. Or if you just want to change the configuration of a plugin, we update the configuration, we test, we deploy, and we go. And this is how we can support this API lifecycle in this automated way. Um, Jay, do you want to talk through the kind of the end-to-end -end use case that we've got here? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Melissa. One, uh, what I'll also say in terms of the security is if you so choose to, uh, to do so, you could add that as a linting step to say, 
you know, they must be one of these different security mechanisms, you know, whether that's kind of a, an OIDC JOT token based security or, um, you know, opaque tokens or any other mechanisms that's kind of okay by your security team. So again, this pipeline can help you ensure that you are kind of meeting those security requirements. Um, essentially, this diagram shows you um, kind of a zoomed out view of the pipeline and the different flows that are happening and the different components that are being used. Um, and the fact that, you know, some of the testing is happening in different environments or different clusters. So we're running the unit tests locally within a CI environment. We, you know, you, you could have a dedicated performance environment to do your performance tests, um, which would mean that you need to make sure all your dependencies, et cetera, are there. Um, you could also have um, right at the end, you could promote your API into the next kind of staging environment or you know, UAT environment to do those. Um, so it's, it's kind of an interesting setup. Like I said, I've seen many, many different variations of, of these pipelines. And as long as you're kind of following the uh, GitOps as well as kind of the DevOps philosophies, I think you, you stand in good standing. Um, just before I kind of hand things back to the host, what I also wanted to do very quickly was um, just answer Sri's question a little bit. Um, so this is Kong's kind of plugin uh, hub, if you like, and you can see the different uh, mechanisms available uh, to secure your APIs. Um, so there's, you know, there's a lot of plugins here, everything from kind of basic auth to OIDC, which, you know, OpenID Connect. Um, and that tends to be the, the most popular mechanism I find in securing your APIs. MTLS, Okta, you know, the usual suspects that you, you kind of want to secure your APIs all here. Um, so. any, any other questions? If not, thank you. And I think we're just, we're two minutes over. Jay, uh, one question from my side would be like, uh, is code coverage also being implemented as part of uh, uh, the build phase or how is also, it? Also, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, so again, um, that's something you could add. Um, what you'll probably need to think about is if you've got different programming languages, then you'll probably need a variation for each kind of programming language. So if you're using a lot of Node.js, then you need to have a code coverage checker for Node.js, for Java, et cetera. So that's, again, something very specific to, I think, the environment that you're working in and the tooling that you're going to be using. Does that, does that answer your question? But yes, that's, that's something that I would expect to see as part of a end-to-end -end pipeline. Okay, okay, Jay. Uh, so that would be like uh, the plugins would wouldn't be there and it should be like uh, uh, manually uh, done by the developer itself. Is it something like that? Uh, no. So uh, for example, um, you can use something like check marks and uh, what was the other tool in Java? So you can, um, Sonar Cube, for example. So you can use those types of uh, components to get code coverage, code quality tool. And, and if you know you you could fail the test if you're not meeting a certain threshold. I, okay. I'm not sure what the what the tools would be for Node and other um, you know other languages, but I've, I've worked extensively in the Java space, so I know the Java tools. Got it. Got it. Jay. Thank you. Yeah. Since we are just a couple minutes Sing past actually. the hour. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, uh, very interesting uh, uh, to find out this one, uh, Jay and uh, Melissa. One question from me, uh, Jay. Uh, so, uh, yeah, Melissa explained about uh, the auto scaling and auto uh, that capability. Obviously, that is that is supported out of the box by Kubernetes, right? So, what about the monitoring side? Because uh, obviously, when you build and uh, 
deploy, that doesn't end the world, right? So it's the support is the longer period of time. So what kind of monitoring is available and what kind of support uh, functionalities are available over here? Yeah, I, I can I can take that answer. So in terms of, actually, I'm gonna show my screen again because I think it's easier to see it visually. Um, in terms of monitoring, um, what we tend to see, because again, um, Kong being kind of very cloud native, um, you we have lots of plugins where we can do node exporting to Prometheus, Grafana, um, et cetera. You can see Datadog, Zipkin, if you wanna do kind of distributed tracing. Um, there's things, plugins to inject correlation ID, uh, et cetera. If you want to send request and response to a Kafka screen, for example, um, you know you can you can take that out and stick that into Kafka. Um, so you can get as much uh, much data in terms of monitoring as you want, really. Um, it's 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 very extensible, and Kong really has kind of a, a plugin architecture that allows you to. Um, build plugins to, to get the data out that you need or to apply the security you need, et cetera. Does that, does that answer your question, Harsha? Yeah, yeah, kind yeah. of, yeah. yeah. Um, what, what I suggest we do is before we um, take any more questions, because I'm, I'm mm -hmm. happy to stay around, is maybe we look, we, we announce the winners. Yes, I was going to say, just in case there's someone who had to head on to their next meeting at the top of the hour, I would love to announce a raffle winner. Um, and this is for our Kong, build your own Kong Kubernetes, not Kong Kubernetes, excuse me, I guess you could call it that. This is the Kong meetup, your own uh, Kubernetes cluster with Raspberry Pis. So, Jay, would you do me the honors in picking a number between 1 and 36, please? 1 and 36. Don't pick my I've number because I have no idea what to do with it. 33. <laughs> okay. I hope, I believe this person's still here, which is great. Tejas or Tejas, excuse my pronunciation. Yeah. Uh, you have won the Kubernetes cluster. So I will, yes, you're here. Congratulations. I will email yes. you. Uh, I will email you directly. So look out for your email from Taryn Jones at Kong and get your address and ship that to you. Congratulations. Yeah. And now, yes, we can continue um, with with any questions you all have. Um, I believe, yeah, we have we have uh, this meeting scheduled until thirty minutes past the hour um, with Jay and Melissa. So hopefully, they have a little bit more time for your questions. Yeah. Um, if, before we go into the next questions, I think, because um, we've got Julian on the call with D2IQ, um, maybe, Julian, you can speak a little bit about what the, the monitoring capabilities are out of the box in, in, in your Kubernetes cluster, because I think that might help kind of enrich the answer for Harsha. Yeah, definitely. So um, our platform and especially like day to iq Convoy um, got many uh, tools already integrated and you can like have automated logging with uh, Elasticsearch too. And uh, of course, tools like Tecton CI or Argo CD or Flux CD are all integrated in our platform make it easy to use it and even easy to install it and provision it um, with many add-ons. Yeah. There's any question about data IQ, feel free to reach out or post your message in the chat. Michael had a question in the chat. Uh, he said, if you scale APIs on demand, how do you manage potentially outdated specification that may have now contained incorrect policy configuration? So this is, this is where your GitOps philosophies really come into play because with GitOps, your configuration is essentially held in Git. Um, so they're version controlled. Uh, you might have different branching strategies for different 
um, environment. So each branch is an environment essentially. Um, and you handle that through pull requests. So before it goes into a particular environment, and if you want to change the config, you could say, create a pull request. Um, and once the pull request is kind of merged into the manifest, that's when it's deployed. Um, so really it's, it's, it's down to that. What, what I showed you here is kind of an automated promotion where in the background, uh, what's happening is um, Tecton is essentially um, pushing to Docker Hub and Flux CD is um, you know, detecting the new image and going in to update the, um, uh, you know, the manifest in Git to, to promote it. Um, so essentially we're kind of automating that pull request, uh, if you like, but that's the way I would see it work. Okay. Cool, yeah. I guess you just manage it as code then, rather than, yeah. 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 Absolutely. Let me see if I can bring up the, uh, the example in, um, in GitHub. Jay, we, do we have any trial version of Kong where uh, we can just play around with to understand and then try doing some stuff on our side? Yeah, there, there's, there are kind of Docker images that you can get access to. Um, there's even an open source version if you want to start there, but Melissa might be a better place to answer how, how to get in touch if you need more. So Melissa. Yeah, you're on so, mute. Oh, yeah, yeah I, can follow, I think I've got a bit of a delay between my audio and my video, so I'm very sorry if I just rudely inter Yeah. I've got my audio is flaky and I've got a delay. So I'm sorry if I'm rudely interrupting everybody. <laughs> um, we have a 30 day free trial of the entire Kong platform available. I will put that a link to it in the chat. We've also got a few tutorials that you can follow to actually set up an API ops approach through GitHub Actions. It's a very kind of simplified way to introduce you to how to go through the lifecycle for a new API in this way. Um, if there's also, you can contact myself, contact Karen, if you wanna have any kind of deeper dive conversations, we can pass you on to the sales team if you're interested in evaluating more of enterprise, or there's a lot of the open source community and resources on our website as well. So I'll share a whole bunch, bunch of links in a second. Thank you, Melissa. I was just going to do a quick screen share as well um, to kind of further answer Mike's question. So here you can kind of see the commit history where you can kind of see Flux CD bot making commit changes to essentially the manifest that says deploy this version of, of the API implementation, et cetera. So you can see that we've kind of gone from version six to version seven, uh, et cetera. And that's kind of done by the pipeline. But if you wanted manual stage gates in higher environments, then that would be a, essentially a pull request because um, you're kind of following the GitOps philosophies at that point. Any other questions or any other thoughts or feedback in terms of the pipeline? You know, does your organization do employ a similar pipeline or is there some things in the pipeline that you haven't seen before and you thought, oh, that's, that's interesting? And, uh, Jay, uh, it is really interesting to see uh, different stages of the pipeline and it is getting automated kind of uh, process in and put it into uh, right from design till the deploy stage uh, because I had I did work with uh, APG uh, as API API uh, manager or API uh, gateway so I can see this one whatever you have shown definitely this is better than uh, uh, that one at least uh, I can say definitely yeah 
Uh, and, I, and I think it goes back to what Melissa said earlier on in terms of, you know, as a platform team, you, you know, you do still want to do all the evangelism and all of that and best practice, but the more you automate, you know, the more time you spent doing what you like as a, as a developer or as a platform team, uh, et cetera. So I think, you know, automation is really key. That automated governance is, is the key thing here. Any other thoughts or feedback? Jay, would uh, you like me to launch your last poll? Yes, let's do that. Let's do that. So please, yeah, let us know for the future a demo that maybe you would like to see a deeper dive into, but please continue with questions if anyone has any. I'm not sure the poll has launched. Yeah, it's launched there now. We go. It takes a minute. Yeah. There's a little lag. Yeah. That's all right. I think Vaishak had a question before we launched the poll. Or... Uh, no, no, Jay. Uh, the mic got uh, switched off. That's, uh, that's okay. And um, if it's Tejas, you know, Tejas, you, you've got to get a uh, Kong running on your Raspberry Pi cluster now. You know, maybe, maybe you can put K3S on it, a lightweight Kubernetes cluster, and then get Kong Ingress running on it. I'll make sure and add your emails, Jay and Melissa, so you can help. Maybe them out this should be the uh, topic for our next meetup. That would be brilliant. Yeah, if Tejas is up for it. <laughs> yeah, so we've got about 71% voted already. Just give everyone a few more seconds. I think we've got everyone. Shall we share the results, Tara? I shall, just one moment. Oh, few more sure coming in. The polls are like, oh, oh. I there went we ahead go. and closed it and sharing now just takes a moment. I haven't experienced the lag with the polls before. Yeah, so it looks like it. people are very much interested in Kubernetes cluster and cloud native as well as the Kong API portal. Um, so I think, you know, one of the things we were talking about internally is whether we should do a, a focus session just on the Kubernetes cluster and how, how all of that works together. Uh, I think Kong Portal is definitely an interesting one. Um, and Kong Ingress resource kind of fits into that. Um, and the automated performance and security testing. Yeah, I, I, I think we can, we can do something about the Kong API portal and the Kubernetes cluster. So that's good to know that's what people are interested in. Uh, Jay, uh, one question from my side would be like, uh, uh, you showed the portal where uh, the plugins are all being shown, right? You showed a portal where the plugins are being, sh like, for example, the Kafka plugin. Yes. Right? So how are these uh, plugins being inbuilt onto a co onto your ID? Do we have an ID or something like where the developers use it? Is it a drag and drop feature or something like that? Or is it based on the ID you link it? How is it actually? So oh, there's, a, there's a couple of ways to do it, but I want to give Melissa a chance to answer this question before I come in with my comments here. So Melissa, over to you. <laughs> Thank you, Jay. This is, this is a really good question. Uh, as Jay said, Kong is built on a, uh, is a plugin-based architecture. So any capabilities you want to add, you can do them through plugins. We've got three ways of building your own plugin if the one you want is not available in the plugin hub. Um, firstly, you can write plugins in Lua. Kong is built uh, on Nginx and Lua and Lua JIT. And this is one reason why it is super, super, super fast. But not everybody knows Lua or would like to build in Lua. There is much more uh, familiarity with Go and with JavaScript. 
So we also have PDKs in that support Go and JavaScript. We do not have a graphical drag and drop way of building these plugins. We're going for the kind of the, almost like considering the kind of person that's building the plugin, they would probably find it easier to write it in code rather than through a drag and drop interface. Because this is writing capabilities that you wanna push into the API gateway to add custom functionality to your APIs. So we're making sure that we support engineers in a variety of languages to do that. Um, I'll share a link. Oh, Michael Heat's already done it. Thank you, Michael. So Michael's already shared some links that you can look at for uh, how to get started in that. Yeah. And once I'll, I'll probably add, once you've built that plugin, then there's a number of ways to apply it. You know, you can apply that through the admin API, declarative config, through the UI manager, um, you know, through automated pipelines, as we've just seen. So it's it's kind of very flexible to do that. Um, and, and I guess the key thing is because it's built in such a way to be very fast that just by you adding in different plugins, you don't end up slowing down um, the actual instance. So it's not a, a JVM based mechanism, um, if you like. So that's that's what keeps it lightweight. Um, and only the plugins that you need are loaded. It, it doesn't, you know, it's not like in Java where all the jars are loaded, etc. It's 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 very lightweight uh, from that sense. So it's it's built for speed and low latency. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Jake. Yeah. Any other questions or thoughts? I can see Therese just put a comment in the chat. Uh, this is, I think, for uh, Taryn and Chris. Is it possible? Is it possible to share the links with the participants in an email? Can we do that? Follow up to the whole meetup group. I certainly can. Happy to Great. do that. Um, I can post them yeah in the meetup group as well. Um, so I will, I will send those out. To make sure and get all of these in the chat. Thank you. All right. Seems like there are no more questions, just a lot of praise uh, for Jay and Melissa. So thank, thank you. you so much um, to to uh, Jay, Melissa, and Chris, and for Quadcorp for being here. Um, we appreciate you all joining. We'll hope you, we hope you will join us for our next meetup. We have not a Kong, uh, London specific meetup, but a, a larger EMEA virtual meetup happening next week on the 17th that Melissa is presenting at as well, uh, featuring Kong Connect. So please join us for that and look out for more London specific meetups. Ho like hopefully we can meet uh, in person again soon. Um, so thank you so much, Chris, Jay, and Melissa, and everyone for joining. Uh, have a great rest of your day. Thank you. See you later. Good night. Right. Thanks, Have guys. Nice Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.